tu adesso devi, devi far partire l'illustrazione, già fatto, poi tagli, no? Una volta che Fai attenzione nel testo di Sì, sì, faccio la Ok. Ok, mi resta tutti e tre con me. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me start by asking if there are any questions from my last lecture. Well, if you want to save questions, there is a discussion session this afternoon. All right, so I think we left last time with the development of the Einstein equations. Rho is the energy density, and kappa is 8 pi g. And uh, let's see what else I want to say. This prime denotes d by d eta, and a dot denotes uh, d by dt. So this is the Friedman equation. There's another equation from the Einstein equation uh, involving the acceleration. Uh, over a to the fourth, and this is minus kappa over six times rho plus three p. So rho plus three p positive means that the universe will decelerate in expansion. Rho plus three p negative will be an accelerated expansion. And I will often use the Friedman equation in the form 3h squared is equal to kappa rho. All right. Um, now, and we also talked, I said we talked about, actually I did all of the talking if I remember. Uh, we talked about the stress energy tensor. T00 is the energy density. And TII is minus P times GII. And uh, this, of course, is in using the uh, Robertson-Walker metric. Now, to solve for the evolution of A, we have to know rho and P of A. And uh, we can get this from the Bianchi identities. We know that the covariant derivative of the Einstein tensor is equal to zero. And since g mu nu is t mu nu, we know that t mu nu, the covariant derivative of t mu nu, is equal to zero. And, uh, okay, so we can, uh, we know how to do covariant derivatives. It's a mixed contravariant covariant uh, tensor. So it brings in Christoffel symbols or affine connections, if you will. And uh, if you look at the zero component of this equation, doing the proper covariant derivative, not just the derivative, for the evolution of rho, you find rho dot plus 3h, 
Well, I'll write it as 3a dot over a times O plus P is equal to zero. So we're almost there. Our goal is to find the evolution for rho and the pressure because we're going to need both to solve the Einstein equations. So what we're going to do now is to make a simple assumption for the equation of state. We're going to say that the pressure is equal to some constant W times rho. And if we do this, we find that the energy density scales as A, so I'll write this little proportional to, A to the minus 3 times 1 plus W. So you replace P by W rho there. The energy density scales as A to the minus 3 times 1 plus W. And H, A dot over A, is proportional to A to the minus U over 2. So let's look at a, <coughs> at a couple equations of state. The simplest thing we might imagine, well, I don't know whether it's the simplest thing, is the equation of state for the cosmological constant lambda. This has w equal to zero because the, um, I'm sorry, w is equal to minus one. The pressure is the negative of the mass density. If w is equal to minus one, uh, rho scales is a to the zero. And H is also constant, A to the zero. So for a universe dominated by the cosmological constant, the mass energy density is constant, and the expansion rate is constant. The next simple thing we might imagine is a matter-dominated universe where the equation of state is zero. It's also no, called dust. The pressure, there's a C squared in there someplace, the pressure is much smaller than the energy density. Everything is non-relativistic. If the pressure is equal to, if omega is equal to zero, if the pressure is equal to zero, then the energy density scales as a to the minus three, and the expansion rate is proportional to a to the minus three halves. <clears throat> if the universe is radiation dominated, w is equal to minus one, uh, w is equal to one third. Uh, the pressure is one third of the energy density Rho is proportional to A to the minus 4, and the expansion rate is proportional to A to the minus 2. And I'll mention one other that I may have time to get to at the uh, end of the last lecture, and that is a universe that's a kinetian-dominated universe, a universe dominated by the kinetic energy, say, of some scalar field. Uh, this is W equal to 1, where the pressure is equal to the energy density. And uh, for kinetian, rho is proportional to A to the minus 6. And the expansion rate is proportional to A to the minus 3. So keep these in mind because we are going to use them uh, throughout the lectures. Let me include one more result up here. And this is the result for the Ricci scalar. And the Ricci scalar 
um, is minus 6, a double dot over a, plus a dot squared over a squared. And this is also equal to minus 6, a double prime over a. And in terms of using the deceleration equation and the Friedman equation, it's just a matter of arithmetic to show that the Ricci scalar is minus, minus kappa times rho minus 3p. So this we will often use, and this equation we will often make use of. Yes? I'm sorry. So the fourth case was the kinetic energy domination? Yes. Well, suppose you have a massless scalar field where the energy density is phi dot squared, where phi is the value of the scalar field, where phi dot squared is larger than the potential. It's kinetic, dominated by kinetic energy. It's called a kination phase. There are certain inflation models that go directly to a kination phase rather than going through a matter-dominated phase. In particular, often if you have inflation models with multiple scalar fields, you end up in a kination phase. So I just included this. I probably won't get to it, but for no extra charge, I included it. Now, A is the scale factor. It has no meaning by itself. It has no, uh, you can scale it. You can call it 17, 27, 84, pi over 3, whatever you want. So you always uh, think of scale factors in relation to some other value of the scale factor. So often you see defining a scale factor, say A of t divided by the scale factor of the universe today. Anything physical that you calculate will always be expressed in terms of ratios of scale factors. So I can set a scale for the scale factor, and what I can do is to say the scale factor at the end of inflation times the expansion rate at the end of inflation is equal to 1. So these little sub-e's will refer to the value of a quantity at the end of inflation. So in other words, um, so A of A has mass dimension minus 1, the mass dimension of the expansion rate is plus 1, and um, to good approximation, minus 1 plus 1 is equal to 0. So this um, 1 <laughs> has mass dimension 0. Is this too complicated? Yeah, everybody got that, right? Okay, so we're going to use this to rescale the scale factor and it will be a very convenient rescaling when we do particle creation. If you want to uh, define it something else, feel free to do it. Now remember, conformal time is defined by d eta is dt over a, the scale factor. So the conformal time is only um, defined through that. 
so we can add or subtract anything that we want to the scale factor. Just as we could multiply, uh, add or subtract anything we want to conformal time, just as we could multiply the scale factor by anything we want, we can add or subtract anything to conformal time. So I will work with the um, a convention that eta at the end of inflation is equal to zero. So the inflation will start at eta equal to minus infinity and running to zero, and then inflation ends, and then eta will uh, run to positive infinity. Now, numerically, when I calculate, and I'll show you calculations of particle creation, I will assume some background inflationary model. But we can approximate what's going on for a background evolution where we assume de Sitter space uh, going into a matter-dominated phase, then going into a radiation-dominated phase, and shortly, I will demonstrate how we can see this just by having a scalar field dominating the energy density, in other words, the inflaton. But if we use this approximation, there are different epochs. Uh, the first is inflation. And since eta is equal to zero at the end of inflation, this will um, correspond to conformal time from minus infinity to zero. So if we have the energy density equal to a constant in expansion, then A over AE in the inflationary epoch is 1 over 1 minus eta. So as eta goes to 0 at the end of inflation, A is equal to AE. Early in inflation, as eta goes to minus infinity, the scale factor goes to 0. We start with a universe with a small scale factor. H of eta that is equal to a constant because for a lambda dominated universe for De Sitter H is a constant. The other thing that we will need is the Ricci scalar. Things are pain in the neck or pain in the ear. Okay, the other thing that we, we need is the Ricci scalar, and during the De Sitter phase, this is minus 12 He squared. Okay, now for a matter phase. For the matter phase, which will correspond to eta greater than zero and smaller than, let's say, when, whenever reheating occurs, one half eta squared. So during the matter-dominated phase, 
uh, oh, 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 that looks wrong to me. Well after the end of inflation, the scale factor increases as the conformal time squared. We know this has to happen because H during a matter dominated phase goes as A to the minus three halves. And the Ricci scalar is minus three H E squared over one plus one half A to, to the sixth. And again, you can find this just by solving the Einstein equations. Now, this, the scale factor smoothly goes in, smoothly transitions from inflation to matter as eta goes to zero. The expansion rate smoothly transitions from inflation to matter as eta goes to zero, the Ricci scalar does not. So in this simple approximation, there is a discontinuity in, the, in uh, the Ricci scalar. Now, the final, I'll just write radiation. And this will be valid for eta greater than the value at reheat, smaller than infinity. And uh, I'll just write that A over AE is proportional to eta. So you would smoothly connect these at eta reheat. H over HE is proportional to one over eta squared. And the Ricci scalar in a radiation dominated universe vanishes. Now I will use these approximations to understand the results of the numerical calculations. So you really, if R, if the Ricci scalar is important in the calculation, you really can't use this background geometry because the Ricci scalar is discontinuous at the end of inflation. So let me show you the comparison of this. Uh, let's see, share screen. Well, uh, okay, one more thing. Let's do, let's do, ba -ba. good. So this is a comparison between this um, approximate way to look at the evolution and the evolution in a particular uh, a cosmological inflationary model, a quadratic inflationary model. And I'll uh, get to that in a moment. So this is a function of conformal time eta. Eta equal to zero is the end of inflation, and eta is positive. This traces it in the matter-dominated phase. So H over HE is one. 
here. And, but if you look at a particular inflationary model, it's not going to exactly be one. If you look at the quadratic model, it's a little bit larger than one. And actually, it has a logarithmic increase as you go deep into the inflationary era. And uh, so if you look at H after inflation, uh, if you look at it on this scale, it tracks pretty close, closely to this analytic model. And A tracks reasonably closely to the analytic model. I'll point out that if you look closely at the evolution of H as a function of eta just after inflation, you see that H oscillates in this model. It decreases roughly as A to the minus 3 halves, but there's oscillation in it, and we'll see that these oscillations are caused by the oscillation of the inflaton field after inflation. Here is R over 6HE squared. In the analytic model, it would be minus 2. But in the quadratic inflationary model, it has a logarithmic growth in R. It becomes more and more negative. And after inflation, it actually will oscillate around 0. And you see it is discontinuous at A over AE of 1. So this analytic approximation works fairly well, but uh, is not exact. OK, now I want to talk about inflation and its aftermath. You see, the English word aftermath has nothing to do with mathematics. It means what happens after inflation. So what we want to solve cosmological problems is a universe that starts off in acceleration as uh, a quasi-de-sitter phase. Quasi means h is not exactly equal to a constant and then uh, transitions to a matter-dominated phase. So this can be accomplished by the assumption that there is a scalar field and uh, it's tradition to call every scalar field phi. So they'll see many phi's here, but they'll all be different. And, um, uh, and this scalar field, we don't know its origin in some fundamental physical model, but we do know a nice name for it. It's called the inflaton. Not inflationton, but an inflaton. So let's assume a real scalar field with Minkowski action and a simple potential, one-half mu squared mass times phi squared. Now, 
Now we're going to promote this to a curved space. So eta will go g mu nu. And uh, the fancy derivative, the covariant derivatives of a scalar is just the derivatives. And the square root of minus g is a cubed. So we're also going to assume that the field is spatially homogeneous. So the only derivative that will um, uh, enter will be the time derivative. So the action will become uh, d4x a cubed one half phi dot squared plus uh, 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 minus minus one half mu squared phi squared. All right, now we can use the Euler-Lagrange equations to, define, to find the equation of motion. The equation of motion uh, will be found by taking the variation of L with respect to phi dot dot minus the variation of L with respect to phi and setting it equal to zero from the Euler-Lagrange equation. So it will be A cubed phi dot dot minus, I'm sorry, plus uh, mu squared phi is equal to zero a cubed times mu squared phi is equal to zero. Okay, just a simple Euler-Lagrange equation. Uh, so this ends up a uh, phi double dot plus three h phi dot um, plus mu squared phi is equal to zero. So I'm just taking the derivatives here and divided by a cubed, and I end up with this scalar field equation of motion. And in general, if you would say, well, what I want to do is include a uh, potential that's not a quadratic potential, then this mu squared phi would just be dv, d phi of v. Okay, so we, we have the action and we can calculate the energy density and the pressure for this scalar field. The energy density in phi is going to be one half phi dot plus one half mu squared. That's T zero zero, and the pressure minus half mu squared phi squared. And you would just get this, well, I'll write an equation. You know that T mu nu is 2G mu alpha G nu beta. Variation of L with respect to G alpha beta. from the usual definition of the stress tensor, and T00 is equal to rho, and TII is minus P uh, GII. 
So if we have a scalar field, the inflaton, where, so we can do rho plus 3p. I can do that calculation. What did I do? This is proportional to a double dot is equal to 2 phi dot squared minus mu squared phi squared. So if the kinetic term down is much less than the potential term, then rho plus 3p will be negative. And a double dot will be positive because a double dot is, propor is proportional to minus rho plus 3p. So if the potential term dominates, and you can put... Um, two times the potential in there, if you will, if the kinetic term is much smaller than the potential term, then you will have inflation. So let's think of what happens here. So we have a potential for phi that is quadratic. And let's imagine phi starts in a homogeneous state at some value there where uh, the potential is much larger than the kinetic term. And we have the equation of motion for phi and as long as this kinetic term is much smaller than the potential term it will be a, an accelerated expansion but it's not going to be exactly de Sitter space because as a scalar field evolves in the potential, it's going, you know, solving a ball rolling down a hill is something that we all love to do. It's going to go faster and faster and faster. The kinetic energy will grow and grow and grow. The potential energy is getting smaller. So there will be some point we'll call it phi e, the value of the inflaton field at the end of inflation, where one half phi dot squared is equal to one half mu squared phi squared. And at this point, inflation ends, and what is the field going to do? It's going to oscillate about the uh, bottom of the potential. So after inflation, in fact, during inflation also, rho phi is one half phi dot squared plus one half mu squared phi squared. Uh, so let's look at rho phi dot. How does the energy density in the inflaton field change? Well, that's phi dot phi dot plus mu squared phi. Phi d mu squared phi dot phi. And uh, then we can use the equation of motion for phi double dot. And what we find is that rho phi dot 
is minus 3h phi dot minus mu squared phi. Oh, no, I'm sorry, that's phi double dot. Putting in the value for phi double dot, rho phi dot is minus 3h phi dot squared. So rho phi dot is going to chain, is going to be proportional to phi dot squared. Now, so phi dot is oscillating around the bottom of the potential, and actually it's a damped oscillation about the bottom of the potential. But if we look over one cycle as phi oscillates, of a cycle in the oscillation, this is the energy density in phi. So phi is trading potential energy for kinetic energy. Look, it's a simple harmonic, os damp simple harmonic oscillator, uh, but this is simple enough. So rho phi dot is minus 3h rho phi. If you average over a cycle, And the solution for this is rho phi is proportional to a to the minus 3. h is a dot over a. So it looks like a matter-dominated universe. So with this simple inflaton field, we've started in a... Um, quasi de Sitter phase with the universe accelerating inflation and have gone smoothly to a ma at the end of inflation, a matter dominated universe where the energy density is decreasing as a to the minus three. Now I wanna do one more uh, thing with this equation we don't want to keep the universe matter dominated. At the end of inflation, the universe is frozen. It's in a low entropy state. All of the energy density is in the zero momentum mode, the homogeneous, spatially homogeneous mode of the inflaton field. It's a low entropy universe we want to turn the low entropy universe into the hot Big Bang. And the way we can do this is by saying, well, the inflaton field decays. So we can add a term that's gamma of phi, the decay width of the inflaton field, times phi dot is equal to zero. and assume that phi dot, uh, that gamma sub phi, the decay width of the phi, is sufficiently small that it only happens after inflation ends. So after inflation ends, uh, the inflaton field oscillates around the bottom of the potential as in a matter-dominated universe, then it decays, converting the energy density in the zero momentum mode, the cold universe, into uh, the hot Big Bang. Just with this, we can calculate the reheat temperature. So at end of inflation, the expansion rate is just defined as H sub E. In the matter-dominated phase, the expansion rate 
is the expansion rate at the end of inflation and it's going to decrease as a to the three halves as a matter dominated expansion. So let's just make the approximation that at some time after inflation, the universe suddenly, everything, all of the energy density in the inflaton field is dumped into radiation. There's T reheat, eta reheat, and the scale factor of the universe at reheating. So 3h squared, m Planck squared at, at, uh, at reheating is, uh, e is going to be converted to radiation. So this will be converted into radiation energy density. Again, this is just the Friedman equation. What is the radiation energy density? Well, it's pi squared over 30 g star T reheat to the fourth. G star counts the number of degrees of freedom that is going to be in the thermal bath, correctly accounting for Fermi-Dirac statistics and um, uh, Bose-Einstein statistics. Well, let me just take this equal to one. I'm just, just going to ignore factors of pi and g star in 30. So, you know, 2048 pi to the fourth, that's one. So I can calculate that T reheat, and again, ignoring factors of three, is the square root of the Planck mass times H at reheat. I'm sorry? Yes, yes, yes. So it's only accounting for the energy density in the radiation component. And by radiation, I mean relativistic particles. So it counts, photon it counts every particle where the mass is smaller than the temperature. And this is going to be very high temperature, so all of the standard model particles will have a mass smaller than T reheat. Yes. So these yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. That's the usual scenario. And um, more thing that I will do is write what is H reheat. is H at the end of inflation times A at the end of inflation divided by A to the three halves because it's matter dominated up until the uh, time of reheating. So A over A reheat uh, is M Planck to the one half, I'm sorry, M Planck to the two thirds H E to the two thirds divided by the reheat temperature to the four thirds. Congratulations, we have gone through all of the background information necessary, and now we can do particle creation. So we're going to assume that there's an inflaton field that's dominating the energy density of the universe, determining the expansion rate of the universe, determining how the scale factor changes in expansion. So the 
inflaton field is determining the background evolution of the universe. Now we're going to add another scalar field. What are we going to call it? Phi. We're going to add another scalar field that's a spectator scalar field. So this poor scalar field is just sitting there watching the universe expand, being modified by the expansion of the universe, but it's not contributing to the expansion rate of the universe. So it is a spectator field. So before we add this spectator field and see particle creation, is there any, are there any questions about this background information that concludes the lecture, yes, that, that concludes the first lecture? Yes. Could you remove your mask, please? Well, it has physical meaning. If we knew the identity of the inflaton, what its potential is, where does it come in some fundamental theory? Uh, we would be able to do all these calculations, but we don't. So the inflaton field is so important, um, and we expect it you know, it's not something that uh, God w woke up one morning and she decided, okay, I'll throw an inflaton field in there. It's connected to some supergravity, grand unified theory, supersymmetry, string theory, uh, asparagus. You know, I, I, I can think of other words that it's connected to, uh, but we don't know what it is. And... Uh, it, but it does create employment for cosmologists. So I have a friend who's a string theorist. I don't have any friends who are string theorists. I already said that. But if I fi had a friend who was string th a string theorist, she would say, look, I have this string theory model. It's a model of everything. And look, there's an inflaton field in it. Then I would pull that inflaton field in make the potential more general than, mute, than a simple quadratic potential and calculate everything. And then it would disagree with observations and I would tell, ah, your theory's wrong. <laughs> Annoying string theorist is one of the pure pleasures in life. <laughs> there was another question. Yes. Sorry? Do I have a motivation for a spectator field? Well, the infla if well, scalar fields are like rabbits. If you have one, maybe you only have one. If you have two, you end up with many, many, many <laughs> scalar fields, right? Many, many, many rabbits. So it could be, so the inflaton has a mass uh, which indicates a new mass scale in nature. It could be that there's only one field which has a mass comparable to that. But what we've learned in physics is every time we encounter a uh, particle with a certain mass scale, there are many particles with that mass scale. So that's my motivation. So it could be that there are no spectator fields, there's only the inflaton field, uh, in which case I will stop lecturing now. Yes. Yes. Yes, there's a question here. He asked about the Higgs. Could, could the Higgs be the inflaton? The spectator field, yes. The Higgs will be created due to the expansion of the universe. The Higgs is not a good candidate for the inflaton field because its mass is too light. Mm -hmm. 
other one? The other one is this analytic model here. So I say it's analytic because it's analytic. There's no numerical calculations involved. So I'll use, so I will use a numerical model to do a numerical calculation of particle creation. But then to understand the features, we're going to fall back often on this analytic model. So keep this analytic model in mind. Yes? Sorry? I have many models. The inflaton? Well, the inflaton, in order to reheat the universe and create the radiation dominated phase, the inflaton field has to decay. See that little magical capital gamma phi up here? So the inflaton field decays, and the decay products of the inflaton thermalize and produce the radiation-dominated universe. If there is, uh, sorry, if there is, if this model of a single scalar field a single inflaton field is correct, then the universe will be radiation uh, will be matter dominated at the end of inflation. Yeah, because all of the energy density is in the inflaton field. Now, um, here I've assumed that the quadratic potential is 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 the potential of the inflaton. Um, you can predict, assuming there's a quadratic potential, all of the parameters of the CMB, of the cosmic microwave background radiation. And I will show tomorrow that the predictions of the temperature and isotropy, the uh, scalar spectrum, the tensor spectrum, all this, these things, can be understood by gravitational particle production. And when you go through that and do the calculations and compare it to the observations of the microwave background, you will find that this model, the quadratic model, is ruled out. Not by a lot, but it's ruled out. However, the CMB studies the potential, the inflaton potential up here, and a lot of the time we will be interested in the inflaton potential near the bottom of the potential in a quadratic approximation. So every potential more or less looks quadratic, very close to the minimum of the potential, so the quadratic model may not be a bad approximation, for particle production, even though it's ruled out. Okay, just let me start with a new spectator field. And the simplest thing to start with is to assume that the spectator field is a scalar field because scalar fields in this is easier to do and if we understand all the intricacies of a scalar field it will make studying fermions, spin three halves, massive vector fields, etc. that much easy, easier. All right, so let's assume that we have a scalar field Phi, which is a spectator field.
Now, uh, I love action, so let me write the action for the spectator field in Minkowski space. A simple scalar field theory. What could be simpler? Now, let's promote this to, min to curve space. The covariant derivative of a scalar is just the normal derivative, so I don't have to do anything fancy there. Now, I could in principle add a term here. Oh, 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 oh. A term proportional to the Ricci scalar. So the Ricci scalar is zero in Minkowski space. So when you studied quantum field theory in Minkowski space back in the eighth grade, you didn't see this term. Now, here C is a constant. So why would I add this term? Well, there is no reason not to add it. And in the idea that we should include all renormalizable terms in the action, then in principle you should add this term. And this is the only dimension four operator involving R, R mu nu, R mu nu alpha, you know, either the um, Riemann tensor, the Ricci tensor, or the uh, uh, Ricci scalar, this is the only term you might add. So it's not forbidden, and generally in quantum mechanics, anything not forbidden is compulsory. So there's no reason, why do you add that? Well, there's no reason not to add it. So let's uh, take a break for coffee and come back as soon as uh, the long line for the coffee ends. And we will start with this action in curve space, convert it to Friedman Robertson Walker metric, and then we're going to quantize it. That'll be a lot of fun. Expand it in Fourier modes with the correct, in terms of creation and annihilation operators. All these things we learn to love when we study quantum field theory. Okay. If I get the students together without the bell, I get a prize. Nobel Prize. <laughs> All right, enough of that. Okay, so we have an action. And uh, before we go to um, I'll just write the equation of motion before we go to far W. It's just um, this looks like the Klein-Gordon equation 
with the possible addition of this term involving the scalar curvature and um, box here where these involve covariant derivatives. Now the scalar is just the usual scalar, as just the usual derivative, but now the covariant derivative of this will bring in uh, the Christoffel symbols, etc. Now let's go to FRW. And in FRW, I guess I never told you, but everyone already knows that gamma zero zero i, uh, gamma zero zero alpha is equal to zero, gamma i j zero is delta i j a a dot. This is in FRW. So we can calculate these, the covariant derivative of this. And we end up in FRW that box phi is phi double dot minus a to the minus two uh, gradient squared phi plus 3h phi dot. Good. Now, uh, we, can t we can know how to calculate the stress energy tensor, and we can take the trace of the stress energy tensor. There's a term proportional to the mass plus two additional terms. Now, remember, I talked about vial invariance, conformal invariance, conformal rescaling. And an important aspect of that will be whether the trace of the stress tensor vanishes or not. So here, the trace of the stress tensor is proportional to two terms. One is a term proportional to the mass. Another is a term proportional to 6c minus 1. So if m is equal to 0 and c is equal to 1 6, it is conformally invariant. And we will see that conformal invariance means that you will not create these particles in expansion. So C equal to one sixth is called conformal coupling. So if you want to create particles in expansion, you either have to have a non-zero mass or C not equal to one-sixth.
Oh, I can use this. So let's look at the action in conformal time in FRW. So this is the action in conformal time. Now we're going to want to promote this theory to a quantum theory. So far it looks classical. We want to promote it to a quantum theory. And we want to impose or use canonical commutation relations. So the canonical commutation relations involve commutation relations between the field and its momentum. But the kinetic term here is not a canonical kinetic term. So I don't know, looking at this action, how to impose canonical commutation relations to make it a quantum field. So what I want to do is to introduce another field. Chi is equal to A phi. And if I do that, phi is equal to chi over A, so that I will end up with a canonical kinetic term. So in terms of this new scalar field chi, It has a canonical, canonical, uh, canonical kinetic term there, so I'm going to be able to quantize it. And it, it, with the introduction, it, the property is introducing another term. Um, into the action proportional to H and So this is nice. This is, I have to do this to get a canonical kinetic term, but I've introduced, um, for the, instead of just the mass, so I still have this term, a squared chi squared. And also introducing it also when you go through the arithmetic, making this with an h squared a squared chi squared. So there's still this sort of annoying derivative here. And I want to do an integration by parts there. Uh, I can write this as minus one half d eta a h chi squared 
minus one half r over six plus h squared a squared chi squared. So this is just arithmetic. Now this term is a total derivative and when I integrate over eta as a goes to zero at the beginning of inflation this term will vanish and late in the universe h will go to zero and that term will vanish so I can ignore this term, just remove it as a total derivative. And again, my goal in this is to find an action with canonical kinetic term appropriate for promoting this to a quantum theory. So now I can just write the action as something that looks almost it has a kinetic term. And it has a term that I'll just write as one half a squared m effective squared chi squared. And I'll define m effective squared as m squared plus one sixth one minus six c times r. So the term proportional to the Ricci scalar comes here, comes from that. This h squared, when I did the integration by parts, cancels that h squared. So this looks like a usual um, scalar field theory. The only difference is that this term that looks like the mass term is going to be changing with time. So this is what we're going to start with, this action, and now we're going to promote it to a quantum field theory. So the scalar field operator, chi, this quantum operator, chi hat, that's going to satisfy the usual commutation relation, chi hat, pi hat, and these are the equal time commutation relations is I D3 X minus X prime. So, uh, so I was sloppy. These are equal time commutation relations. This is at point X and that's at point X prime. The usual equal time commutation relations. Then, you know, the usual prescription in quantum field theory, you this is a quantum field rather than a classical field, and you are going to decompose decompose the scalar field into mode functions. So the way I will do that is write this quantum operator d3k over 2 pi cubed 
in terms of creation and annihilation operators, A of K, that's an operator, times some mode function, chi K of eta, e to the i k dot x, plus an annihilation operator times the complex conjugate of the mode function, Okay, so this is all standard from quantum field theory. Now I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I'm in an isotropic space. Space is isotropic, so there's no preferred direction in space. So spatial isotropy implies that K is only a function of the, uh, of the magnitude of k, which I will just write as k. So that k is not a four vector, it's a magnitude of the three vector k. So k is the square root of k dot k, the magnitude of the three vector. It's not a four vector. Now, um, so, uh, poor counting skills, two comes after one. Um, the term in the action that's the gradient of chi squared is just going to go over to minus k squared chi. And the momentum is just chi prime, prime being the derivative with respect to eta. So imposing the equal time commutation relations, equal time commutation relations, And you can put an H bar in there if it makes you happy. So this is in the field operator. Now I can use that commutation relation using the fact and end up with a something that's known, known as a normalization condition, chi k, these are the mode functions, chi k prime minus chi k prime chi k is equal to minus i, no, oh, plus i. And the commutation relation for the creation and annihilation operators, AK, AK dagger, is 2 pi cubed, this would be another, at another momentum K prime, D3, K minus K prime. Okay, so yes. 
Uh, I'm sorry, sorry. Yes, thank you. Here? Good, thank you. So I set two, I made the approximation that two is equal to one. Okay, so we're doing quantum field theory. Now we want to define a vacuum state. The vacuum state is defined such that AK annihilates the vacuum for all K. And this should be a vector, but since we're in FRW, it only depends upon the magnitude. This is what you would usually do in Minkowski space. <clears throat> and this definition of the vacuum is natural, but it's not unique. Um, and when we go to curve space, it's going to be a subtlety, an ambiguity in how the vacuum is defined. Now, the mode functions, chi k of t, e to the minus i omega t in Minkowski space, are eigenfunctions of the energy operator. And the vacuum is un invariant under the Poincaré group in Minkowski space. But in curved space time, we cannot in general define positive and negative frequency modes since technically uh, general space time does not admit time like killing vectors. So in general, there's no unique natural positive and negative frequency modes to define. And when we go to set initial conditions for the mode equation, we will see where that comes in. All right, so we have mode functions chi sub k, and associated with mode functions chi sub k, we have the uh, creation and annihilation operators a and a, da a, and a dagger. Now, suppose we choose another orthonormal basis of mode functions. So we said that the vacuum is ambiguous, so the mode functions are ambiguous. Let's uh, suppose we take um, another another orthonormal set of mode functions. And let's call this other set of orthonormal mode functions psi sub k rather than chi sub k associated with this other set of mode functions will have associated with it uh, creation and annihilation operators, let's call it B. So this transformation between mode functions goes by the name that you may have heard, Russian Bogliubov, thank you. It's a Bogliubov transformation. I can go to another orthonormal set of mode functions. And I can write uh, the mode, I can write chi k 
as D3K over 2 pi cubed times uh, B sub K chi of, no, psi of K to the plus I K dot X plus of k psi sub k star e to the minus i k dot x. Now you usually don't do this in Minkowski space because in Minkowski space there's a natural set of mode functions, the positive and negative frequencies, uh, but in curved space there's not. Now we can express this, making their ortho, both orthonormal set of mode functions. We can express psi of, psi of k as alpha times chi of k plus beta alpha of k and beta of k chi star of k. So we just do an orthonormal transformation. And associated with the psi sub k is the vacuum state. Let's call it a vacuum state with a little bar over it. And this is defined such that b of k for all k. And just as we made the orthonormal transformation to write psi as a function of chi or psi bar as a function of chi, uh, we could also write the Bogolyubov transformation to relate uh, creation and annihilation operators. Now you see that although B of K on this vacuum state vanishes, A of K on the vacuum state defined by this orthonormal set of mode functions is not equal to zero. It will be proportional to beta of K star. So if I want to count numbers, if I sum over k, this will count the number, this counts the number, not forget about summing over k, this counts the population in the vacuum zero bar of the eighth K um, creation and annihilation operators. This is equal to zero because this annihilates the vacuum but in the theta bar vacuum, it's not equal to zero. It's proportional to this Bogliubov coefficient, beta of k squared. So the vacuum associated with the psi k modes have a number of particles associated with the 
mode function, with the vacuum associated <coughs> with the mode function chi. Now, you usually don't encounter that, again, in Minkowski space because there's a natural, va there's a so-called natural vacuum in Minkowski space um, where the mode functions are the positive and negative frequency terms. However, imagine you have an accelerated observer in Minkowski space. Then you would have a different um, orthonormal set of mode functions associated with this accelerated observer in Minkowski space. And this accelerated observer would see particles in the vacuum compared to the, Minkowski, the, the, Minkowski, the unaccelerated Minkowski observer. This is known as the Unruh effect, more properly known as the Fulling Davies Unruh effect. So in the expansion of the universe, the mode functions change. And uh, if conformal invariance is violated, and it's going to be pop, the vacuum will be populated with particles compared to a Minkowski vacuum. So we're going to see particle creation. Any questions? We're almost there, we're almost creating particles. I'm going to create particles, nothing up my sleeve. I'm gonna start with the vacuum and create particles. Unruh, U-N-R-U-H. Bill Unruh. And there are also other names. There's um, Davies and um, there's another name associated with it that I just said, the, sorry? Fulling. Davies Fulling effect. An accelerated observer in Minkowski. An accelerated observer. And so you, you define a vacuum in Minkowski space. The vacuum is different for an inertial observer in Minkowski space than it is for an accelerated observer. Accelerated observer is another way of saying what's the equivalence principle? It's related to a gravitational field. So in the presence of a gravitational field, there are particles in the vacuum compared to the Minkowski observer. And that's what we're going to encounter. Well, if you, um, any mode functions that's not the positive and negative frequency modes in Minkowski space will in general have particles. And this is something that is usually not talked about in quantum field theory because there's a natural set, because Quantum field theory, as done by particle physicists, or when you take your quantum field theory course, is done in Minkowski space, where it's an inertial observer. So everything that you were taught in quantum field theory has to do with you are an, uh, an inertial observer. If you're a non-inertial observer accelerating in Minkowski space or in a gravitational field, then there's not a natural uh, mode set of mode functions and um, vacuum state. All right. So let me do about 
another 10 minutes worth of stuff and then we will quit for the day. So in general, we can write the solution for chi, for the mode functions, in terms of parameters alpha k of eta, and for the normalization, it's the square root of 2 omega k, e to the minus i capital phi of k of eta over 2. And this is capital phi of eta over 2. And the function capital phi of eta is 2 times the integral over eta, let's say d eta 1, of omega of eta 1, uh, right, so this is a general solution of the wave equation. If omega is constant, this is just e to the minus i omega eta. This is just e to the plus i omega. If phi, capital phi is constant, it looks just like positive and negative energy um, solutions. So if we put this into the mode equation, you'll find that chi k double prime minus, not that it makes any difference, So, right, uh, I'm sorry. So I've assumed now, let's just take the positive energy solution. So if I, and let's make it one to have be correctly normalized. So if I assume it's a positive energy solution, if I assume this to be the solution, this is what the wave equation looks like, the mode equation. And this in general is not a solution to the mode equation if omega k prime or omega k double prime is not equal to zero. So you can define an adiabaticity parameter A sub k as omega k prime uh, over 2 omega k. If A of k is much smaller than 1, this term will be small also, then this positive energy solution will be a solution to the mode equation for all time. I'll say the absolute value of AK is equal to zero. Positive energy solution
And if A sub K is larger than approximately equal to 1, then the positive energy solution with alpha equal to 1 and beta equal to 0 is not a good solution if you start in an initial state with a positive energy solution if A of K is much larger than 1 the positive and negative energy modes mix All right, um, I think I'll stop there now. And uh, we're almost ready to create particles, but you see what's going to happen. You're going to start with some initial time deep in inflation with a vacuum defined by only the positive energy modes. Then if during the evolution of the universe, if this happens, it's going to mix the positive and negative modes you're going to end up creating particles. The mode functions are going to change, the vacuum associated with them are going to change, and you're going to create particles. That will be so exciting tomorrow. All right, so I'll see you in the discussion.